Hi everyone, my name is Nick Zonier. I'm uh, working on LLVM at Google. And I'm Greg Hackman. Um, I'm on the Android kernel team and I've also been working on getting the kernel building with LLVM. And we're here today, uh, we were here last year talking about um, kind of the work, the initial work we got um, focused on compiling the Linux kernel with Clang. And this is pretty much a status update of you know, where have we um, come from since a, a, about a year ago. So just as a quick kind of background of like, what even is Clang, what is LLVM, why do people even care about it kind of thing. Um, I would say this is kind of the overall like very high level architecture diagram of LLVM itself where kind of the whole reason for, for it to be is to kind of separate out the comp compilation pipeline into um, various kind of well-defined stages where the idea being is you have some kind of intermediary representation um, where a lot of your core traditional compiler optimizations live in this middle end optimizer. You have separate back ends and there's multiple different ones. I started adjusting this to put all the back ends in there and then became this big massive thing. So I said, ah, whatever, we'll just put a couple there. Um, and then you end up having a couple different front ends for various languages. So if you've heard of Clang, Clang actually has multiple kind of source languages that it supports. And then there's kind of external projects um, like Rust and Swift, and there's front ends for languages like D. I think there's a Ruby one. There's a big list online. You can go look it up. Um, but I think one of the things that's that's really really cool about the LLVM ecosystem is that fixes to these parts in the blue end up benefiting kind of all these different front ends. And so what's really nice is as we get more people interested in language development, uh, when they choose to target LLVM and they choose to add optimizations to LLVM, that can actually indirectly improve the performance of LLVM from compiling C and C++ or, or you know, other languages that other projects might, might care about. Um, and LLVM itself is actually now more than just kind of this one compiler tool chain. The whole, uh, the whole project itself is a collection of compiler utilities. So for instance, and they're meant to be broken apart. So for instance, let's say you have some project and you need to parse C++ code. You could write a, your own C++ parser. Good luck, it's not a lot of fun. Or you could link against libclang. And you're not getting all of this backend part, you're just getting the lexing, parsing, and semantic analysis if you really want it kind of thing. Um, so kind of having this modular design uh, is neat. It makes development, local development on LLVM a little bit faster, and then you can link it all into one big monolith uh, for like a release build. So there's a couple different parts within LLVM that are, uh, I would say, analogs or substitutes to various parts of GCC and Binutils. So just like you might invoke GCC or G++, there's Clang and Clang++. Um, then I would say the, the alternatives to say the GNU assembler is Clang itself has what's called an integrated assembler. Uh, today for the kernel, we actually turn it off because there's a fair amount of assembly that uh, the Clang's integrated assembler doesn't support just yet. Um, and I think there's still a, a, a long tail of, of things to add there, but work in progress. Um, GNU AS is part of bin utils, so a bunch of these things, um, like the, the linkers themselves are in bin utils, and there's actually two. There's BFD and, and gold. Most systems will have LD sim linked to BFD. It's kind of the default. Um, LOVM has, a, has an alternative linker that, that exists called LLD. Um, it's heavily multi-threaded. Um, it it's, tries to be performance oriented from, from day one. Um, further, bin utils, uh, utilities like OpsDump, OpsCopy, Strip, FeedElf, a whole bunch of them, there are, are LLVM based implementations that can actually share a lot of code, right, from being part of the LLVM uh, project. So there's kind of the equivalents all have this LLVM dash prefix on them. Then uh, you'll have various system libraries. So libgcc will typically have um, various parts of the runtime that don't come from the C library. So you, for instance, a lot of your compiler built-ins kind of get linked in from, some of your compiler built-ins will be linked in from this library, some of the sanitizers and stuff. Um, LLVM has one called compiler RT. Um, and then, uh, for instance, there's an alternative, or LLVM-based uh, uh, C++ library implementation called libc++, if you ever see that floating around. 
um, kind of thing. So these are, everything on the left here is kind of exists within the LLVM project. Um, and they, they exist as kind of alternatives to uh, what you would get with GCC and, and bin utils. All right, so uh, I get this question a lot. Why do people in the kernel community, why should they care about client? Um, and the short answer is competition's good. Um, having two compilers means that they are both going to keep evolving. Uh, there was even a discussion yesterday about how GCC's compilation has significantly sped up uh, probably largely as a response to Clang, because one of Clang's early advantages was that it was very fast. But apart from just things like speed, um, there's a lot of interesting new compiler technology that's developed on Clang first, and either is eventually taken into GCC or you know just stays in Clang. Um, things like AutoFDO is a Google-developed technology for uh, collecting uh, um, runtime uh, uh, performance data without modifying binaries. Um, there's some control flow integrity stuff um, to protect against return-oriented programming. Uh, SCS, could Shadow, you, call stack. Shadow Call Stack is another piece of, of that that re re protects against re uh, return-oriented programming. Um, Bolt is some additional link time optimization that was contributed by Facebook. Um, Clang D is uh, an interesting project like Nick described where you can actually take the C++ parser um, and use it as a back end for an editor, um, which has led to me doing interesting things. I actually use Klein D plus Visual Studio Code on Linux to compile the Linux kernel, which if you sent that statement back in time 10 years, <laughs> people would think I was crazy. <laughs> um, and then there's LLD, the linker. Um, on, on top of that, a, a lot of people have, because LLVM is relatively easy to code on compared to GCC in many people's opinion, uh, a lot of interesting static analyzers and dynamic analyzers have come to Clang um, and either stayed in Clang or later gotten taken to GCC. Things like KASAN, uh, uh, KUVSAN, I believe were both developed in Clang first. Um, there's uh, some interesting thread safety analysis features. Basically, if you're familiar with the uh, thread annotation features that, that are in some of the compiler headers in, in Linux that you can use to use external tools to check the, the basically that uh, locks, for instance, are being used as documented. Uh, Clang actually has features like this built in. You can just put in a compiler pass. Um, there's an external static analyzer that uh, can find a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, but there's also just the advantages of just feeding your code into two compilers. You get warnings from both compilers, so you can shake out undefined behavior or bad behavior that maybe GCC or Clang would have missed in isolation. Uh, it's also mutually beneficial for LLVM. Uh, Linux is a very large project, a very complex project, and so having it as a test case to um, throw at LLVM has benefited both code bases. Um, one sort of fringe benefit if you work with a lot of different uh, architectures is that uh, Clang, unlike GCC, is a single, you can configure it to basically be multi-targeted. So you have a single binary that targets every single architecture you care about. Um, so you, if you work on several different architectures, you don't have to have hundreds of megabytes of tool chains. You just need the one. So um, the priorities we've been looking at for um, getting Linux kernel running with, uh, with LLVM, there's basically three different categories. Um, basically, what's, what step it's at, what architectures we're looking at, and what actual tools we're deploying. Um, so we've, we've gotten to the point where it's building, it's booting, and it's actually shipping on some architectures, on some devices in production. Um, we recognize a lot of people want more than that. Um, so we are actively working, as we'll discuss in some future sli uh, slides in a bit, um, on doing continuous integration to make sure, for instance, that uh, a new client changes don't re uh, break the kernel or vice versa, uh, similar to that they already ha that already exists for GCC. Um, a lot of people, for good reasons, are concerned about building the kernel warning free. Um, right now, that isn't possible with Clang because Clang is somewhat picky about some things the kernel does. Um, and there are, we're working on, on that. Um, and then there's the basic polish. And then once, once we get to that stage, and I think the, hopefully the kernel community will be more comfortable with Clang, we can start thinking about, well, what kind of features can we add to the kernel that maybe haven't landed in GCC yet? 
Um, so things like some of these analyzers that have not reported GCC, like could we start featuring these with, uh, if you use Clang? Um, likewise, we've been mostly, at least uh, within Google, we've been mostly prioritizing ARM and x86-64. Um, there's been some interest in uh, both PowerPC and RISC-V. I believe RISC-V is mostly from the, the hobbyist community. I don't believe we're working on that. Uh, but uh, it, we, we will link to a GitHub uh, page later where we basically show, where, where we're basically tracking uh, this development and where we're accepting exter external contributions. So that's where stuff like RISC-V comes in. Um, and again, most of our work is focused on actually compiling the kernel with Clang. We're still using bin utils to link and assemble it. We're getting fairly close, at least on some architectures, to being able to link the kernel with, with LLD, which is nice because it's significantly faster than, than bin utils in my experience. Uh, the Linux kernel has very complicated build scripts, so or link scripts, so this is still a work in progress, but we have like gotten, ex we have experimentally gotten LLD link kernels booting on ARM64 dev boards. Um, then finally, as Nick mentioned, we do want to assemble the kernel with Clang, but that's kind of a longer term project because Clang's integrated assembler um, does not accept all the constructs the kernel uses. I know one of the issues people have had with the past um, in the kernel community with Clang is uh, the communication with the LLVM community wasn't necessarily great. And so there were a lot of specific compiler features that people really wanted in LLVM that LLVM did not support. Um, and this has been changing a lot recently. Um, so for instance, people have for a very long time wanted Clang to respect the F no delete no pointer check flag. Um, that is actually now shipping in Clang 7 as a result of concerns within the kernel community that this is an important flag. Um, likewise, uh, a couple features that broke def configs on ARM64, um, one involving the way that you name <coughs> registers in inline assembly clobbers was fixed in Clang 7. Um, uh, support for LSD Atomics required some very specific code generation flags, and those are now supported in nightly Clang 8 builds. Uh, one issue that's been a concern mm -hmm. for a lot of people has been Asm Go To. Um, that is has not landed yet, but there is a prototype patch that has been contributed by Intel. And this is just, I'm just sampling a handful of these because these are the ones that I know people have specifically called out as the LLVM needs to support this before we take it seriously. Um, but we, there's a link here, basically, if you look on our GitHub track, you can see there's a lot of also smaller issues that have been fixed in LLVM as a result of increased interest specifically in the Linux kernel. If you want to try it, um, it's fairly straightforward. You, If you're building for the same architecture as your host, you just say make CC equals Clang. You can also optionally say host CC equals Clang to build the host tools with Clang. You don't have to, um, but you can if you want. Uh, likewise, if you want to cross-compile, it's the same way as cross-compiling any other kernel. Uh, you just set the arch and cross-compile flags. Note, you don't have to set the, you don't have to point to a different Clang toolchain, like it's the same binary. That's, like I said, it's one of the advantages of Clang is that it's multi-targeted. And if you do want to experiment with, with using LLD, you can pass uh, LLD.LLD as a linker and see how well it works. Um, the caveat I will give you, other than please don't ship LLD link kernels in production right now, um, is the LVM moves very quickly. So if you're just using the Clang issues with your distro, there's a reasonably good chance that it is missing fixes that, that have landed that are important for the kernel. Um, and so you can either grab pre-builds from the uh, LLVM uh, themselves that releases at LLVM.org, or uh, Google rolls some pre-builds with cherry-picked uh, fixes for things that are important for Android, um, and we distribute those in AOSP. Are, are those on, I think those are linked by releases.llvm.org, or, or do you mean they they have their own? They're on app.llvm.org. Okay. All oh, right, yeah. But it's, it's very easy to integrate if you have Debian based. Hmm. Well, we had concerns yesterday, people want the opposite. They wanted to not have a dev uh, a Debian group house, or they want just tarballs. So if you right. want just tarballs, that's where you go get them. Right, but for half the people, it's fixed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, uh, like I said, we, we are actually, Google is shipping Clang built kernels in production. Um, we couldn't unfortunately tell people last year because of bad timing, but actually both Nick and I were carrying phones running Clang built kernels to, to Linux plumbers. Um, so if you have a Pixel 2 or a Pixel 3, you're using a Clang built kernel. And in addition to the Pixel 3, we have turned on and are using in production uh, link time optimization and control flow integrity checks. Uh, and 
can't really say too many specifics at this point, but you should expect to see a lot more of these coming soon on the Android side. Um, also on the Chrome OS side, they have recently flipped the switch so that their new devices that are based on 4.19, 4.14, and 4.4 are now built with Clamp. Uh, so one of the things that, that we're doing is we're, we're trying to work with existing um, continuous integration uh, folks focused on, on testing out kernels. So uh, cur uh, Lenaro's kernel CI team is, is ramping up support for, for Clang as part of, kind of testing various versions of, of different compilers. Um, one of the things that, that, we're, what, that we're trying to do um, to help uh, make their, their builds a little less noisy is drive the warning count down to zero. That way it's easier to tell when a new patch introduces a new warning. Kind of thing. Having a clean starting uh, point helps a lot with that. Um, some of the things that are a little tricky uh, to work out is um, being able to test all the different configurations, the possible configurations in the kernel to guarantee that they work with Clang. Um, one of the things that's tricky is you can compile an all yes config and still not get all of the code in the kernel. So the name is a little, naming's a little tricky on that, that make target um, because you do have um, either alternate, alternate implementations or mutually exclusive configuration options. So um, in all yet, just because an all yes config builds with Clang doesn't mean all of the code in the kernel compiles with, with Clang. Um, I think some of the testing infrastructures do rand configs, which I think helps a lot, but it's also random coin flips. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, th I think, I think, r like we've heard, Rand config proposed as fair solutions, um, and I think the tricky thing with that is just uncovering all the possible combinations. Um, so, but then we try to see, like, are there some configurations that we want to guarantee are never broken, and that gets into tricky territory between, like, you don't want to bless any one given configuration, other than I think the dev config is is the one that people all kind of agree on, uh, at least for having that as a. But then the ones on top of that is always a question. Um, and then questions around which do we prioritize? Do we prioritize mainline? Do we prioritize next versus LTS branches? Um, I think when we started out, we were focused on main mainline. And then every time the merge window would open, next would bring down a bunch of patches and we'd wind up broken again. So now we're focused on next properly. Um, and then try and keep track of when fixes land, uh, fixes on the kernel side that, that we need. Um, making sure that we do the work to backport those and get those into the LTS branches. Um, we're in communication with Intel's zero day bot team. I, I think uh, some of the, the ASM go-to stuff on x86 derailed that conversation a little bit, but um, I think once once we have that feature implemented in, in LLVM, we'll try to start up those talks again. Um, and then I wanna show off a little bit of some of the external testing that we've been setting up um, just on, on kind of GitHub and Travis CI, kind of uh, some external stuff. Um, and the idea is, is we want to grab as kind of as new a snapshot of various branches as possible, um, build them with as, the, as recent a build of Clang as we can, and then boot test it in QEMU. And the boot testing in QEMU stuff is very nice because we can scale that very, very wide on, on virtual machines um, versus with an Android land we have very expensive devices, device labs that have many devices hooked up to host machines, and uh, we can't quite scale the testing uh, as rapidly as we can in, in with QEMU. Uh, so, so this is something that 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 we set up fairly recently. Um, but let's pull up a build here. I've been like fingers crossed that the build stays green for the talk. Oh, look at that, it's red. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so we can see here, like uh, some, of the, some of the build targets we have is uh, uh, we're building, we have an ARM uh, dev config, I guess it's multi-V7 dev config uh, that, that's building continuously with Clang. Uh, we have uh, ARM64 dev config build that's additionally being linked with LLD. Uh, we have a PowerPC little Endian um, build and uh, we have some x86 stuff. I think I know what's appropriate with this, but um, I think the issue is probably related to some 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 patch files that, that we have to help test some things in the meantime. But um, essentially, what what ends up happening is is this is a cron job that runs on Travis CI daily, 
it's not not quite every commit, so maybe not as continuous as we would like. Um, but it pulls down a Docker image essentially, um, installs our kind of cross bin utils that, that we need. Um, what else are we doing? Uh, pull down QEMU, uh, fetch our LVM toolchain from the, the Debian, the app.lvm.org, uh, which should have nightly builds in it, getting Clang and LLD from it. Um, we're using Ccash quite successfully, I would say. If you're not using Ccash, one of the big issues with building the kernel with Clang, uh, with Ccash in particular, is you get lots of almost 100% cache misses from including the build timestamp in headers that get included everywhere. Um, so that tends to thrash the Ccash, but luckily there's some environmental variable, or I guess there's some K build variables that you can set. Um, so we don't really care about the build timestamp. So we set those out and then I'll show you later the stats we print, we get good cache hit. And that cuts our build time down to a 10th of otherwise not using Ccash. Um, and Travis has some interesting setup to be able to store those cache files and pull them back down again. Um, so let's see, what do we do? Uh, export some variables, check that we have all of our stuff that we need. Um, so here we print out, here's the, the latest commit that we were able to fetch here from, from stable, um, do a def config, and then start doing a full build. Have some warnings there that we need to go clean up. And then uh, right around here, Okay, so here we got a build done in a minute on a two-core machine, thanks to Ccash. Um, and then we, we do a boot test in QEMU. So we've been working um, with Gunter Roque on Chrome OS side of things to figure out um, what are some of the best ways that, that we can boot these kernel images. So uh, you give QEMU basically the kernel image that you just built, and then you kind of need a, a root file system, otherwise we get a panic early on trying to, to mount some root file system to get an init. Um, so we have a basic um, overlay. We're using build root successfully to build a very small user space. Um, we have a bunch of, all of the, the kernel self-tests are co configured on. So we, we run through all of those, um, make sure that, that we pass. And then assuming that this all looks good, we just have an init script that prints the version string and then shuts the machine down, which exits cleanly. This helps a lot for automated testing to see uh, did we boot successfully or not? And typically what will happen is if there's some regression or something, uh, there may be a panic that will hang the machine. QEMU doesn't exit. We use a timeout utility that uh, just sets a return code saying, nope, this didn't work. Ccash says, oh, look, we got 100% cache hit. Good job. And then Travis goes and backs all that stuff up. So uh, let me see if I can find a build real quick that just has more information uh, for one of the cron jobs so we can see. Uh, we try to split things up between like pre-submit and post submit. Um, okay, so here's one of the, the cron jobs. That was green last night. Uh, so you can see here just some of the variants that, that, that we build for. So um, this this build, this target and all the ones above are mainline. Then we have a bunch of builds of Linux Next running. Uh, and then work in progress. I'm trying to add all the LTS branches um, for these things, but uh, I need to send Greg more patches kind of thing. Um, Uh, so if you're interested, how, how can you uh, get involved? Uh, we'd love to take any kind of bug reports of people who try this out. Um, so Greg had the instructions on an earlier slide of how, how you can try to build your kernel with your configs. Um, so we have a public issue tracker. Uh, LVM also has an issue tracker. I find it hard to work with. And people tend to file bugs there and then not CC anyone. So it's almost like sending them into the void a little bit because people aren't necessarily going through the bug tracker and kind of finding these. But uh, I find it very easy just to work with uh, GitHub as far as like being able to add labels and, and sort things based on how many patches we have. So um, we've done a fair amount of work um, kind of fixing a lot of, a lot of uh, issues on, on both the compiler side and the kernel side. And I'd say we have a fair amount of open issues right now, but I would say I feel pretty confident because most of these we have patches that are already submitted or accepted. It just takes time for them to actually bubble up and land in stable, or maybe they need to soak in next. And then once they make it to, to mainline, then we can start back porting them to get LTS branches and stuff. But there's not a, there's not a whole lot that I'm, I'm too worried about these days. 
Um, one of the things that, that I've seen from other projects that works really well is um, I think if you take the time when triaging a bug to say this is low hanging fruit that I think if someone's interested in getting started contributing either to the Linux kernel or to LLVM, if you tag it appropriately and, and leave it unfixed for a little bit longer, uh, that's a really great way to encourage external contributors to get started with the project because there's, there's many people who aren't in the room today um, who probably would like to be. And I think if we expend a little bit extra effort, we can uh, help enable them to be successful uh, open source contributors. Um, so, so we have some bugs tagged as, as uh, good beginner bugs. Uh, if you're interested in trying to help out, trying to fix one of these, I think the biggest thing is just getting, getting the reports is, is a big one because I'll, I'll run into someone and someone will say, oh, I tried it and it didn't work. I say, oh, where's the bug report? And I'm like, so so we, like, we need to be, people need to be sending us the bug reports. Like we need to be aware of them kind of thing and then we're trying to help enable people to be successful uh, if, they're, uh, if they're courageous enough to try to also fix them uh, as well. Um, if you want to use LLVM's issue tracker, most important thing, please CC me or someone on it um, kind of thing. Uh, there's a, some, some of the things that helps us a lot is uh, godbolt.org is this amazing utility. If you haven't seen this, um, it's an easy way to share links of, uh, of a disassembly. So you have like this multi-pane setup. On the left, you can put some, some C code or C++ or various languages, and then you can create multiple additional windows. So uh, you can, here's a, a, a trunk build of Clang and a trunk build of GCC. Here's the disassembly. You can put the compiler flags in here. And then what's super nice is you can click share. And like these links are awesome because someone can say, hey, LLVM is broken in this regard or you know, there's a regression between these versions of LLVM and the disassembly kind of thing. And th this is super helpful um, for compiler folks to kind of see this. Um, and having that link that exists is something that you can reference in commit messages. Um, and it's just like super valuable to see exactly what the problem is, what's going wrong, other than like it doesn't work kind of thing. Um, some other tools that I've had great success with, there's a really nice program called C Reduce. So let's say you have a you know, some, some translation unit is failing to compile with LLVM. Uh, C Reduce is this really neat utility um, that, that tries to take an input test file and a separate shell script that, that just re returns whether or not it should proceed or not. And it mutates the input and tries to pare it down until you have a very small input test case. Um, I've been trying to help test some of the LLVM as and go to uh, implementation. Um, patches and I was hitting some issues linking the final kernel image and I, I was able to end up using C reduce pare down exactly which source file from the kernel was causing this miscompile and send this to the patch developers and say here's an exact like real life code that exists in the wild I mean it, it's been obfuscated a little bit through C reduce um, but it's significantly smaller um, and this is a case that we need to make sure that we handle correctly because today we may not be kind of thing. So th that's a neat utility that you can kind of uh, let it run for a little bit and it, it will kind of make things a little bit simpler. Um, one of the things that's super useful as well uh, for kind of filing bug reports to compiler developers is knowing which flags are used exactly uh, for a translation unit. So um, both, I would say, kind of pre-processing your source files before sending them is important because um, where you go and fetch your headers from uh, maybe difficult to reproduce that, uh, but then also certain certain flags tend to change radically code generation, and so if you say, "Hey, the C the C file work doesn't work for me," but then you don't include the compiler flags, which may be kind of tickling that bug, it could be very difficult for the compiler vendor to, to reproduce. So two tools that work really well. Uh, there's this open source utility called Bear that hooks make, so you can say. Uh, yeah, you basically, when you're building the kernel, you say bear, and then your build command for building the kernel, it dumps a JSON file that just has these triples of what's the translation unit, what's the exact flags that were passed to the compiler, and what's the output file if you want to rename it or where you want to put it kind of thing. Um, but the kernel, if you don't want to use bear, the kernel already today generates these dot translation unit 
like file name .o.cmd files, uh, wherever your your output is. So wherever your .o files are, you'll have these kind of hidden dot command files. And if you actually open those up and take a look, the kernel does record the exact uh, compiler flags passed to the compiler. And those are super, super helpful and important as well. Um, some code that we've seen that's been problematic in the past for Clang, um, in particular was variable, uh, variable length arrays, but more so when they were used within the, the definition of a structure. Um, so luckily they're all gone entirely out of the kernel. Uh, Case and many other folks have been working on, on eliminating them entirely and now we actually warn if, if we see them uh, in the kernel. So to clarify, uh, variable length arrays you can have at the end of a structure according to standard C. GCC has an extension where you can actually have a variable length array in the middle of a structure. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, I know that there's an LKML post from Linus about how much he dislikes it, but apparently this is something Clang will never support because it's super complicated and according to case, the code it generates happens to be really, really awful as well. So everyone wins from having this removed. Um, Clang doesn't support nested functions. They're not using the kernel, it's not a big deal. Super easy fix anyways. Move it external, mark it static done. Um, Built-in constant P was something uh, that's more of a polish kind of bug when we go back to our priorities where um, we identified some differences between Clang and GCC as far as um, wildly different edge cases where they differ in whether or not an integer constant expression is constant or not and very interesting use cases in the kernel. Uh, I think we have a set of, of, of patches that, that fixes the last incompatibilities here, but um, that, that's been one that's been pretty tricky, giving us a hard time. Um, Asm go to today is not supported in, in LLVM, but we're trying to help out with code review and get, get that feature landed as soon as possible. Um, we identified a few false, false negatives, like warnings that, that don't look correct. Um, when, when things aren't on fire, I try to fix these up <coughs> kind of thing on, on the Clang side. Uh, but we have a pretty good knowledge of, of kind of what's missing or what's lacking there in Clang that we can fix up. Um, and then when I was testing the as and go to patches in LLVM, one of the, I found this like curiously recurring pattern that was a little tricky where the kernel in a couple places has these uh, static <coughs> functions that are marked always inline uh, and they contain inline assembly code and the inline assembly has uh, some constraints on, on uh, the parameters going to the ASM block. And it, it turns out that um, when you compile this code with GCC at 02, it's, there's no issue. If you compile it with GCC at 0, it says this is semantically incorrect and it's a build error. So there's places in the kernel that only can compile in GCC at 02. And the issue there is um, this is an issue for Clang because Clang, when I talked about that three-stage pipeline in the beginning, semantic analysis is handled early on in, the, in the, the front end of the compiler. Inlining is part of the optimizer. And so if you require code to be inlined first for it to be semantically correct, that's a problem for Clang. So, uh, so I, I don't know the, the, the questions are around built-in constant P and uh, one of the many edge cases kind of thing. So um, my understanding is that uh, we've kind of identified these problematic use cases today in the kernel in like the test suite for this, these set of changes going into Clang and LLVM right now uh, actually use these instances from the kernel as their test cases um, and I believe that they're all being addressed in the in the current patch set. Kind of thing. But do, do you use the inliner logic from GCC start to end? Do you use the same thing? There were there were many moving pieces in the patch set as far as uh, when exactly uh, we evaluate whether something is is considered constant or not. Um, but it, it did require adding various intrinsics to the 
the inter intermediary representation to kind of su support this notion better. And it, it actually served dual purposes because my understanding is there's some changes coming in C20 that can build off of this work um, related to context work. But that, that's my the, the limit of my understanding of the problem. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks for everyone who's who's been helping us out with this. Um, on our GitHub, uh, we have an organization, and I try to invite as many people to it that have you know helped out in, in some way or another. And it's too bad by default it's private because we have over 40 people kind of helping out kind of thing. Um, so you know we're we're super lucky to be here talking about all this work, but it, it's been a lot of work by a lot of different people. Um, I'm just curious, show of hands, has anyone here tried to build their kernel with Klein? Okay, I think I think that's. I, I am overjoyed to, to see that. <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the things that, that always breaks my heart is when we send a patch to a maintainer, they say, I don't care about Clang. Well, I think we can kind of say, well, a lot of other people do. Thank you. The question was how, how often do you uh, actually update the tool chain for AOSP for LLVM mm -hmm. if I'm going to look to use that for building? Yeah, so I think uh, we're looking to get to improve the process around the, the <coughs> release cycle for the LLVM pre-builds in AOSP. Um, I, I would like to get to a maybe six week cadence kind of thing and then uh, it's even important for us to kind of provide this information to the various uh, vendors in the Android ecosystem saying, Hey, this new tool chain, uh, like we've we've done significant testing on it with our device kernels and internally in AOSP Common, and we we believe this to be a high quality tool chain release. Uh, we would like you to go out and test it and re start reporting bugs. So we're looking to start doing a, a six week release cadence. We've done a lot of work to catch um, Android's LLVM up to near top of tree LLVM, and there, there's still more work we're going to do there. Um, I would say the big thing with the, the Android pre-builds, uh, the whole reason why they exist is just to have a different release schedule than the upstream LLVM. We don't try to put proprietary stuff in the compiler ever. Instead, when we need a feature for the kernel or for some other part of the platform, we want to put a binary out there so people can go forth and test. From a learning perspective, is there a library of examples I can look up of, you know, this case works well on GCC but throws a warning in Clang? Um, I, I would say, so when, when we talked earlier about like a, the additional warning coverage, I, I kind of, like in my head, I picture warning coverage as like a Venn diagram of, you know, there's the all the different kinds of warnings, like explicitly named flags that are dash W flags. And I think there's a very large overlap between warnings that are implemented both in GCC and in Clang. I would say there's then separate or unique parts of those, those, those two overlapped, uh, those two circles um, where you have flags that are unique to GCC and flags that are unique to, to Clang. Um, so from like a warning perspective, uh, the best thing that I've seen so far is I think somebody has a, a GitHub page where they keep track of you know which flags are unique to which compiler kind of thing. Um, as far as code gen goes, if people can find them, like let us know because that, that's a bug on our on our side in LLVM that we should be fixing. Um, you showed a list of architectures that you plan to build regularly. One of them that I'd really like to see there would be a hexagon, which is no, nobody, not, not a lot of people use it, but it's the one architecture that does have a Clang support upstream, but no GCC support in, in mainline. Okay, uh, yeah, I think I think there's like we 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 posted the list of the kind of architectures that we're focused on, but we th in no way 
we don't mean to discourage uh, any of the other architectures. And in fact, I'm trying to help enable um, external contributors who have more resources to, to work on these various architectures to help enable them be successful in compiling their kernels with Clang. So if, if someone has any architecture that's not on that list, uh, one of the ways that you could really help out is, is helping us, uh, let us know what, what we're missing today, or if we're good to go, um, helping us wire that up into the continuous integration systems uh, that, that we talked about earlier. All the way in the back. We're starting to get a few kernel options that depend on GCC plugins. What's the Clang solution for those going to be? Yeah, I think um, <coughs> I don't have a solution for that today. I, I I think some of the GCC plugins are are tricky. I think it's uh, it's good to think about what the plugin is trying to do. Um, like, is this something that is better implemented as a compiler flag if possible? Because some people use the plugin system as a way of kind of prototyping a new option on top of, of the compiler rather than uh, like forking the source and trying to build something into the source like that. Um, I think GCC plugins are going to be problematic for people uh, as far as even like which version of GCC they're using. They're going to need to have like plugin binary compatibility between those. But there's like, GCC plugins are the ultimate non-portable solution to problems. I guess just a further thing, does LLVM have a plugin system comparably? Yes, Even? Okay. yes, yep. I, I had last tried building with Clang, d doing all the RAND config builds and fixing the things I found a couple of months ago, um, and there were still th thousands of warnings. So whatever you've done in the last two or three months has been amazing because I've just done it it's again. Mo mostly external contributors. Right? Yes. So I think fixing, fixing warnings is, is kind of how I got started contributing. No, to the no but even last week I, I tried it again and it didn't build. Okay. Um, today's release, I get like two pages of warnings and they're all bugs <laughs> in, in the kernel. Okay, good. Um, but uh, yeah, so if, if go forth and test. Uh, Clang Analyzer has a lot of interesting things for um, like resource leaks with um, you know libc file and whatnot. Um, you guys consider adding that for kernel locking semantics, for example? Yeah. So. So the, the kernel locking semantics stuff is super interesting because that's actually like static annotations. So in your source code, you can say like, you must acquire this mutex to touch these members of this struct. Um, and we use it internally in Google 3 C++ code very, very successfully. And it works very, very well. And that's orthogonal to the static analyzer. So the, the lock checking stuff, I think will be super important um, in order to help prevent some of the concurrency bugs that we get bit by especially in out of tree code, kind of again and again and again and again and again. Um, I'm trying to get an intern right now to help uh, test this out and see is this something that will work as a solution or not um, for the kernel. If anyone's interested, reach out to me, let me know. Um, so I, I actually did look at a very simple implementation that's basically having the Clang compiler headers redefine like underscore underscore requires to use the Clang uh, uh, annotations. The challenge I had is that Clang, uh, you have to say this this thing is what's called a mutex class and so forth. And, and I'm going to be a little bit fuzzy here because I tried this a couple years ago. Um, it needs very precise semantics about what a mutex is and what you lock. And the, the Linux kernel annotations are a little bit looser than what Clang is looking for. So a drop-in just header did not work. But I think it's an interesting idea that I'm glad he has an intern that's looking to carry it forward or is looking for one. So so just to talk a little bit more about the the lock the static lock annotations, like in Google 3, if you're writing multi-threaded C++, and you, you add these, start adding these annotations, and you maybe add some code that's slightly incorrect, uh, you'll get a compile time error saying, you should have acquired this lock, or 
hey, you acquired these locks in different orders, and this will lead to a deadlock. I want that in the kernel, right? We should figure out how to adapt this to work well on C code in the kernel and have build time errors. Um, the other part of that is a static analyzer. The whole reason I got involved in, in any of this was I just wanted to run the static analyzer on the Linux kernel to find bugs to, to fix to start contributing. And eventually I went down this rabbit hole of, my God, we just need to get it building because all this, like as I started talking with more and more people that were looking to do all these cool additional compiler features, all of this was predicated on building the kernel with Clang. And so I said, okay, we'll put the static analysis stuff I want to do on the shelf for another day and let's focus on getting it compiling and running well and working for people. Um, so I think that that's a big thing for us um, is giving people the option to uh, be able to rapidly change between their tool chains uh, for uh, solving problems that, that they may have that others may not. All right, I think we're at time. So thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciate it.